Amen. So this evening, I, I, I will be taking us through just a, a little episode of uh, uh, what pastor began on Sunday. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Updated the fact that the word of God is never obsolete. And then it will join something about something that I have been asking questions about uh, in the recent times. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So we are just looking at one scripture so that you can know that it's pastor that is preaching tonight. It's just one scripture. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I didn't set you up, sir. <laughs> it's just one scripture that we're looking at. Praise the name of the Lord. At least that will be the emphasis of uh my our uh, uh of my church tonight. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So I started asking a question that why is it difficult for us to why is it why if I put it to Pastor yesterday? I said, why can't we why can't we as a church? Why can't he as a pastor speak to you, come to come one day and say he's not even telling us by the word of the Lord that he's telling us as a pastor that in this consistency, why can't we why can't we read raise a formidable force in the political system? Why, 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 why are we, why are we so lethargic about, like, like some of our fathers in the Lord, having a lot of branches within and outside of the nation, and then you cannot say, we are come here, all of you, come gather together. We are going to produce the next executive governor of Ogun State. Why? Why can't we say so? Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So I I have not gotten all my answers, but I will share a little bit of what I th think I am beginning to see. As the pattern. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And I have decided to look at patterns because even in our generation, everything that is called codes, codes, you, you are coding this, you are coding that, mainly they operate basically on patterns. Praise the name of the Lord. If every day, there is a pattern for a particular event. You can write codes after that pattern. It is the human intervention that makes the difference. That is just what AI is about. Now, what the graduation is to make AR think for itself. Praise the name of the Lord. But there are patterns in the scripture about what the man of God should do. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And it is in the pattern that we don't get lost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, when I want to establish a doctrine to you, I don't take an event in the scripture and say, oh, the scripture says, Isaac went into the forest and the Lord revealed to him that he should strike the back of a tree naked. And then, because he has done that, the animals should meet in front of that tree. And so, every animal that mated in the front of a tree, they produce strong animals. You get what I'm trying to say? Now, why am, why am I not... Why, why can't I take that one out and say, yes, there's a doctrine after this. So go to your house tonight 
that tree that you are planted, peel it, peel it, peel it. Then come back tomorrow morning. That tree will begin to give you money. Why? Why can't I say that? Because apart from that particular place in the scripture, I didn't see another place after that pattern in scripture. However, I have also seen in the scripture miracles that I am like, how? How did it happen? Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, the issue of patterns, how he did it, that we might follow after how he has done it, is very important in our work with God. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because it is in that that we know things that are expected of us. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So there is a pattern in God. And it's even what we are looking at. That you are not updating him. He's already updated. We learned that on Sunday. The day that we come and say is not accurate in something, or there is something else that we are supposed to add to him, is not God. Praise the name of the Lord. So we have seen a pattern in him, and that pattern we establish as doctrines for men. Hallelujah. Amen. So, so let's I said we are going to look at Luke. Uh, we are going to look at a scripture. Luke 9. Luke 9. Let's look at Luke chapter 9. In the word of Jesus in red. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. How many of us like the word of Jesus in red? How many of us know that that is the scripture? Praise the name of the Lord. How many of us know that the ones that are not eating in red too are the scriptures? Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because they testify of him. What he said testify of him. So maybe it is written in red or it was prophesied about him. He testified of him. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So please don't let the ink confuse you. Please, let's look at the Amplified Version. Because is that's the only scripture we'll look at. So, let's just look at it in Amplified Version. The way it is full. Hallelujah. Then he said to them, For whoever... No, 23. 23. And he said to them all, Who are the them that I was talking to? Who are the them that I was talking to? Should we look at it or we both, all of us agree that it's disciple? We should look at it. Well, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. It's Bible study. Pastor says it's Bible study. 20, let's look at 21 from 21. Please let me give me the chance to start reading from fourteen, verse fourteen. For there were about, for there were about five thousand men, and Jesus said to his disciples, him, and he asked them, who do men say that I am? Now, so you know that before we now get to verse twenty-three that we are dealing with, there was a crowd. Praise the name of the Lord that came to listen to him. And he gave them food 
So it's not a bad habit if you want to invalidate the people or you have evangelized to them and then they said that they need money if you have given to them. If you don't have, pray for them. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. All of them will have a pattern in Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. So after he has blessed the multitude, he prayed privately. And when he was praying, the disciples came. So he had his own company. You know, somebody was making a remark that a lot of the teachings of Jesus, a lot of his teachings, he passed, he carefully, deliberately passed it on to the disciples. He deliberately passed it on to people that we carry him on. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So in, those, in, in, this, in this verse, he began to establish a pattern of, I was saying that, not to just get your, to like pause a little, on the fact that there are crowds and there are disciples in the ministry of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. The crowd will never see his pattern. Because he didn't even show them. Hallelujah. He didn't show them his pattern. For his disciples, he showed his pattern. So he strictly charged them and said, Do not say that I am the son of man. And then in verse 23, where we were going, he said, and he said to, and he said to her, if any person wills to come after me. So we have established that the people that he was talking to here are even the people that he called to come after him. He was charging his disciples. So, how will Jesus call people to be his disciples? And he will be charging them. If you still want to come after me. How many of us have always thought that being born again is enough? I shall make evil. I shall make evil. I make evil. How many of, really? Do you think that being born again is actually enough? What else do you need? You are born again. You are spirit filled. You have prayed to God in the morning to send down rain on your enemy as answered. What else do you need? So if you have called you a disciple, you know there were some people that he called disciples that people never thought that they can even smell the no money otake. Temple. Not to talk about coming close to the altar. But there was a pattern in the Father that even those that he called disciples charge.
Delhi. And he, and he said to all, if anyone wills to come after me, let him deny himself. Disown himself. That's what Amplify said. He said, forget, lose sight of himself and his own interests. Refuse and give up himself. And take up his cross daily. The light on the altar does not go up any day. That is the assignment of a tribe in Israel. They see to it daily. And lastly, Matthew 4, 19. Matthew 4, 19. The last part of that scripture said, take up his cross daily, his cross daily and follow me. Follow me. Matthew 4, 19 said, he and I say to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. See, what we are looking for in God, we will not get it by, by meeting, so by, by pure language congress, by anniversary that it is once in a year, or pure language congress that is maybe every quarter of the year. It will be it will be a daily following. And it is in the following that we become made into that vessel that I have in mind. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. See, it is in following that there is understanding. That was what we were praying about. It is in following that there is understanding. It is in following that uh, Ananias, no, it's not Ananias. This man that went to pray for Paul is Ananias. It is in following that you will know that, Father, this guy, I have heard about him. He does not regard anything that is the gospel. It, that is following. It is in following that you get answers. It is in following that understanding comes. It is in following that you fish men and not fishes. It is in following that you don't turn men to fishes. It is in following that you are crafted. Because you are the one that will see to the end. If following was not important, when they wanted to choose a replacement for Judah the Iscariot, they would not go and find out who has been the one following us even from the beginning. The person was not necessarily part of them. But sir, there is something that is called staying power in following. It is not everybody that can follow. And that's why no, they don't get made by that process. Because it is in following that you get offended. It is in following that you see, ah, see how they are doing it. They are not supposed to do it that way. But it is in that following that you will eventually understand the reason for these doings. And because understanding is very, very important. When we don't follow, 
we don't come to understand what he was trying to say. How many of you or of us, as God declares something about you or unto us, and then you just, you run with it like that? Only for you to, for him to come back to you and ask you questions about what he has declared to you. You know, Pastor said something on Sunday when he was talking about updating or updated. He talked about the dragon, the dragon that was, how many of us remember that plot point? The dragon that was, that was, that fire was coming out of his mouth. And he said it was a helicopter. How many of us saw it like that? Our Wale is a good student of scripture. Another person that I've seen it like that before, that you have seen that that dragon that fire was coming out of his mouth was uh, Tukano. And you think that you have seen everything. Please follow. Please follow. When you follow, you will see it. Oh, you want to know why some disciples died by Matthias and Paul died, uh, Saul died normal death? You know, if you ask me that question, Seb, I don't have an answer. But please don't give up. Continue to follow. Because you will see, and understanding will come by following. So, if there is anybody that wants to, that wills to come after me, one, let him deny himself. Yes, deny yourself of flesh, that's normal. But also deny yourself of your own interest, as Paul has patterned. Let him take us. Let him take up his cross consistently, and let him follow. Because it is in following that you are made. It is in following that there is understanding. Hallelujah. 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 I hope Pastor Femi have been able to convince you without confusing you that God's word is updated. Say amen. All right. Turn to Luke. Luke chapter 5, from verse 36 to 39. Luke chapter 5, from verse 36 to 39. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece of a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. No one puts new wine in old wine skins, or else new wine will burst the wine skins and be spilled, and the wine skins will be ruined. But new wine skins must be put in new new wine must be put into new wine skins, and both are preserved. Verse thirty nine. No one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for it says the old is better. So this scripture says there is old wine 
and there is new wine. Isn't it? This thing called old wine was new wine at a point. What made it old wine? What made new wine old wine? Passage of time. Okay. Is there something that the passage of time does not change? Look at Leviticus 26 verse 10. Leviticus 26 verse 10. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. Somewhere in the book of Jeremiah was speaking about Moab. He said Moab is like a, it's like a bottle of wine that has retained its scent because it has not been torn from vessel to vessel. So, for example, if you have a bottle of wine that you have not opened, it's almost like when it is produced. But when it has been opened and probably you even change it from bottle to bottle, there is something that happens to its taste. There is something that happens to its concentration. Isn't it? So that's how something that was new somehow becomes old. Praise God. And one of the things we said on Sunday was from John, Joshua chapter 9, from verse 3 to 5, and verse 12 to 13. Joshua 9, 3 to 5. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they walked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. They took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, old garments on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. Verse 12. So they began to explain to Israel, this bread of us, we took it out for our provision from our houses on the day we departed to come to you. But look, now look, somebody say now. Now look, it is dry and moldy. These wineskins which we filled were new and see, they are torn. These are garments and our sandals have become old because of this very long journey. If we look into ourselves today, the, the, the people say all men have their prices. Which means, it does not matter how resolute somebody looks. If you apply the right amount of pressure and circumstances around that person, that person will cave in. And many times when people cave in, they become a very exact uh, uh, opposite of what they have been. Like these people said, look at this. This thing that you are calling dry and moldy was hot. There was a time it was fresh bread. You could smell the, the butter. This thing you are calling one garment was new. What they are just trying to say, and it was actually a deception, but the truth of the matter is that the raw material for what anything that is called old was something that was called new. Because things happen. One of the things we studied on Sunday was the story of the young prophet and the old prophet in 1 Kings chapter 13. The young prophet. How many of you know the old prophet is a prophet of God? How many of you know the old prophet is not a false prophet? Hmm? So, what could have made the old prophet to do what he did? I want to just throw up as 
thoughts for us. What could make the old prophet do what he did? What could make the young prophet do what he did? Are you following? Because the young prophet at a point at first looked at the king to his face. Even if you give me half of your house, I will never turn back to come and eat in this place. There was a man, that, that man was able to resist the promises of a king for the world. But could not resist the meal of a whole prophet for the world. And it looks like two different people. We saw a very resolute personality in the earlier part of that story. And we saw somebody that caved in at the later part of the story. Are you following? Because he, he followed, he ultimately battered what looks like the normal process of man. That subjected to time, people change. Isn't it? Now, when Jeroboam became king in Israel, he raised two idols, golden calves. One of them in Dan. He told Israel, he said, the place going to Jerusalem is too far. He said, these are your gods. Then the Bible said he did one and placed him in Dan. And if you're a good student of the Bible, Dan was in the northern part of Israel. The person that told them that where they are going to worship God is close. Placed one of his gods in one of the farthest points and people went. So ultimately, it was not about distance, it was about heart. Because the people that saw Jerusalem too far went as far as Dan. Then he placed another one in what? In Samaria. And that triggered something. In 2 Chronicles 11, 13 to 17, let me show you something. 2 Chronicles 11, 13 to 17. 11. 2 Chronicles 11. Now, and from all their territories, the priests and the Levites who were in all Israel took their stand with him. Him there is Rehoboam, the king of Judah. The, the descendants of David. Are you following me? All the priests, all the Levites, all the religious took their stand with wood, with Rehoboam. For the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them from serving as priests to the Lord. There was a migration of everyone who feared God from what? From Israel to Judah. Give me the next verse. Then he appointed for himself priests for the high places, for demons, for calf idols which he had made. And after the Levite left, those from all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord God of their fathers. Question. Suddenly, we saw three types of movement. Priests, Levites, and who? All the people who wanted to please God, what did they do? They moved. The question I want to ask you is, what made the old prophet to remain in Samaria? Probably, some of us have asked ourselves, what made the old prophet to go tell that man? Have you ever suffered loneliness before? This man was a prophet of God that feared God, dwelling in a city that nobody there feared his God. For God to bring a witness to that city, God had to send a man from Judah. Have you waited for something so long that when he showed up, it's as if he wants to go again? Oh, well, that prophet, did you know anything? Have you been alone for a long time? I'm trying to show you what makes... <laughs> What makes what looks like resolutions people have made become things that can change? So they just told him, they said, one man of God came from Judah. He gave a word. The word came to pass. He said, where is he? Why is he looking for him? Because he's a prophet. And can, I just want to give imagination. Probably 
He's been a lone voice. And he's going to find company for the first time. But this is the challenge. The company is, is longing for, I've been given another word. The word not to remain. You can imagine how alone this old prophet has been, and you can imagine how ignored this prophet has been. Suddenly, he found company. Let's look at it. What made the prophet from Judah, the young prophet, what are the things that could have happened to him that made him to change? He came. He gave the word. The king gave him a banquet. Come and eat with me. He resisted the king. He went away. The Bible said a prophet came to him. Number one, there is nobody. Now, we love, if God chooses you to be different, you enjoy it. But after some time, it becomes a body. Every normal human being is looking for. So you know, one of the ways you know you are saying is to look like, is to look. See things that look like you. Have you noticed? How many of you can stand when the entire world does not look like you? To be too sure that you are saying that the one is saying. You don't get it. Because many a times we measure our sanity and our accuracy by how much he settles in. Are you following me? Into the climb. Or into the times. Because the word the young, the old prophet looks for him is that I too am a prophet like you. Is there somebody here who is looking for somebody like, somebody that thinks like you, values like you? Have you noticed that when you find such people, if there's anything that can separate you, there's a tendency to force make those things less important because of what you want to achieve. I, I, I don't know whether you get this. So, because this man just moved from Samaria and nobody is like him. There's a longing to be conformed. There's a longing to belong. So much Jesus had to tell us that we are blessed if men reject us from their company. Do you know the power of company? Do you know how many people have changed who they are? Just to belong. Company can challenge your conviction. You first enjoy being alone. Can you be alone on a conviction for 15 years? And the world seems to be moving along. They are moving on. It's as if you are forgotten. Then God's like something else showed up that looked like. That came to tell you, you are not mad. Will you let it go? Hmm? So when that man said, I'm not like the king. I'm a prophet like you. I think I was all. He found company. Because everyone here wants company. We enjoy it. God has singled me out. How long can you stay out? <laughs> God has singled me out. He called me from the midst of a crowd. He called us from the midst of a crowd, and after some time, we begin to long to belong again. Because it's going to be so cold to be so isolated. And before you know what is happening, it's as if certain things that you have held high before, you have to bring low to belong. Let me bring you another thing. When you read Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 16, there are three beasts. There is a dragon. You see the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. The dragon in Revelation chapter 12 was the one that made war in heaven. And the scripture told us it's Satan. Then when you get to Revelation chapter 13, there is a beast that came out of the, of the sea. And that beast had power. Then the Bible said there was another beast that rose up. And they called that beast the false prophet. Which means 
Is it not amazing in this story that a man that could resist a king could not resist a prophet? Why is it that the, the oppressions that the enemy built at that time in Revelation, it didn't limit it to the beast. If you look at the beast that came out of the sea, it was like a king, it was ruling. But there was another beast. And they called the other beast the false prophet. There are some of us that can undo persecutions from opposition, but we cannot undo persecution of be not being included in the sense of religious accuracy. You don't get what I'm saying. God, the devil knows some of you can stand if men reject you, but you cannot stand even within the church if God had to say, that position everybody is taking, you cannot take it. Most people can stand the beast, but they can't stand the false prophet. That's why the enemy kept throwing everything that he... Most of us here are not looking for much. But listen, it doesn't mean that we are not susceptible to deception too. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, take it to yourself that you will not be deceived. He was talking to the disciples. He said, they will persecute some of you. They will kill you. But do you know the next thing he said? Many will come in my name. Many false prophets will arise. Why will he have to place in the same context you being persecuted to death and the rise of false prophets? Because many a times you can stand even being persecuted to death, but you cannot stand. And do you know something about the false prophet in Revelation? The Bible says he did many mighty signs. If something produces signs, there are many Christians that say, well, since I cannot say it's God, I will keep quiet because I cannot say it's not God. From Deuteronomy chapter 13, he's been telling us, he said, if a prophet arises in the midst of you and shows signs and shows wonders and these things come to pass, but that prophet told you to go after another God. He said, you should stone it. He didn't say, compete with him. I said, I will show you my greater sign. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, most believers today, if they cannot show a sign that the false prophet is showing, they think they have a right to only keep quiet and not state their position. Are you following me? They have been deceived not by the power of the sword, but by the vastness, one of the deceptions walking on the, on the earth today is the vastness of religious deception. Can I tell you the truth? Anything can be big. Anything, right or wrong. Anything. Because some of us here can stand persecution, but immediately we say anything that is religious and that is big and that is our sign, and the sign is coming to... And you have need. What do you do? He said, where? Let me just be testing it. I won't bring you the warning of the young prophet who could escape the king, but cannot escape a false prophet or a prophet that prophesied falsely. Are you, I'm just speaking lessons. Are you still here? Before, because if you are not careful, you just suddenly discover that who you used to be is not who you are anymore. Glory to God. And the scripture told us a character of God. One of the things I spoke to us on Sunday that is very deep is that the word of God has a character and the character of God's word is that it does not change. Then I now said to us that those who are practitioners of the world share the same character that the world shares. The Bible says those that do the will of the Lord abide forever. He said the world pass away, but those that do the will of the world abide forever. The same way the Bible says heaven and earth can pass away, but not one jot on my word will pass away. So we are, and I told us those that trust in the Lord will be like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. Now, I started by showing you that what is called new today 
What was called old today was first new, which means everything is subject to change. Now, this is the issue. Can something happen to you today in God that will never need an update? You will never need to second guess it. It does not matter the size of a false prophet. It does not matter the wealth and the power of the beast. Am I making sense? That young prophet was called two names. Ah. When you look at it in 1 Kings chapter 13, the first name they called him is the man of God from Judah. The man of God from Judah. But by the time you get to verse 20, 23, So it was after they've eaten bread and after they had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him and the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road, killed him, and his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it, and the lion stood by the corpse. And there men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road, the lion standing by the corpse, and they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now, when the prophet who had brought him back from the, the way had it, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient to the word. It was the man of God that had the word. But it's not the man of God that is disobedient. See, having the word is not the same thing as eating the word. This man came with a word. The first description we had of him is a man that came with a word. But the last description of him is a man that disobeyed the word. Something moved. Two different names is now called. It was the man with the word. It's not the man disobedient with the word. Now, it's fearful. No matter the access you think you are, you must take it and watch. That's what Pastor Feb is telling us, that you can only stay with God by continual following him. You cannot say, because I came with this experience, I have arrived. Because things can change. And the man that a king cannot undo, when a king stretched his hand to, to arrest him, his hand with that, became a man that was wasted by a lion. The man with the word became a man disobedient to the word. Because sometimes, the Bible says it's better not to know the way than to know the way. Knowing the way is not everything. He said you can know the way and what? And turn. Which means after you know the way, you must strive to stay in the way. Are you following? That's what Pastor Femme was trying to teach us tonight. We must, dis you see, there are moments, even as a Christian, you need to sit down and ask yourself, am I truly obedient? I know there's this general, you know, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But you need moments of weighing. And can I tell you the truth? They are not very exciting moments. Such moments are not exciting moments. Moments where you tell God only you know. Where you are not ready to give a false pass mark to yourself. The moments where you say, Lord, examine me. And if there's any wicked way in me, Lead me to the way everlasting. Those are not moments you are easily giving yourself a pass to pass. Are you following me? When those moments come, they suck in. They, they, they are not very exciting moments. But they are moments that strengthen your walk with God. You must get there. Are we together? It was even Paul that said in one of his epistles, he said, even I, I cannot judge myself. Which means, I'm always looking, I want to do everything in his face. Because if I keep marking my own script, I keep passing. And when you keep passing, in your own mind, you can migrate from the man with the word to the man that is disobedient to the word. And the truth of the matter is that the man that hears is not as pleasant as the man that does the word. Praise God. I will still hear. And, 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 and I was trying to bring something on Sunday. 
How many of you remember that when God wanted to have a controversy with Israel, he first had a controversy with Judah? It was the tribe that belonged to David that he first joined. He raised Israel, the ten tribe Israel he gave to Jeroboam, to judge the true tribe Israel that he gave to David. Are you following? But because who is wrong today can be right tomorrow, and who is right today can be wrong tomorrow, is the reason why you must keep following and not assume you have arrived. So when God raised Israel to judge Judah, Judah learned the lesson. Israel that was raised to judge them refused to learn the lesson. They slipped into idolatry. Then God went again to Judah, raised a young man from Judah to come and what? Judge Israel. And before you know what is happening, by the days of the captivity, the 10 tribe Israel went into captivity earlier than Judah they were raised. Every time you are operating in life, no matter how right you are, operate with mercy. Because life has cycles. So be merciful so that you can receive mercy. When God puts people in your hands to put straight, do it diligently, but do it mercifully. Did you hear what I just said? Do it what? Diligently, but do it mercifully. Do you know why? Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20. I'm just gliding. Are you picking one or two things? Are you following me? For there is not a just man on heart who does good and does not. Now, even if you don't use the word sin as sin, but there's no man on earth who never has fault. Even when you are the man raised by God. Are you following me? Let that sink in your heart. Because there are moments of false triumphalism when we, when we triumph and we look at every other person as if they don't have brain. What are they thinking? There are areas of your strength. There are areas of weaknesses in our life that will make a mess of every strength we have. Except mercy covers it for us. And it does not matter how small they look like. Because it's little foxes that destroys the family. Now, let me tie. God said in Numbers 23 verse 19, I am the Lord. Numbers 23 verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. As he said, will he not do it? As he spoken, will he not make it good? God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should repent. He said that in Numbers 23, 19. He said it in 1 Samuel 15, 28, that God does not repent. Which means there are certain things that never become old. When God declares them, they remain eternal and they never change. Which means there are certain things that are not subject to these continuous changes by time. And we have to locate those things. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 14, I'll run through the book of Hebrews for us briefly. The Bible says, when you ought to be teachers, you, are, you need again to be taught the first principles of the oracles of God. You have need of milk and not solid food. This is the way we grow as, as human beings. We start with what? The first nutrition, milk. But it is not designed to be permanent. But when you grow, 
and move from that phase, you come into what the Bible called solid food under normal circumstances. You don't need to go back again and be so dependent. If you take milk now, they told me sometimes, somewhere I don't remember, but medically, that there is a particular portion, there is an age you get to that milk does nothing to your body again. You are, you're only taking it for taste. That is a man like milk. It's not, it's giving, it's not adding anything. But you get to one stage, they will say, stop taking milk. For everyone who partakes only in the milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for it's a babe, but solid food. So we are moving from milk to solid food. And when you get to solid food, you are expected to stay there for the rest of your life. Isn't it? Except something goes wrong. My, um, my question is, are there things you have transited into that will never be subject to change again? Or, because milk is a symbol of that which you are into at a moment, but that is still subject to what? To change. It's new now, but it will soon become old. So by the time you get to Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 1, therefore live in the... Discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let's go on to perfection. Somebody say perfection. What's perfection? Perfection is perfection. Perfection is that which you cannot update. Perfection is that which you cannot subtract and do which you cannot add to. What is trying to, it's still a furtherance of the fact that you have moved from what? Milk to what? Solid food. And so what is the, another word they call solid food in this place is what? Perfection. Somebody say perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. But of the doctrine of baptism of laying on of hands of resurrection of dead, of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits. Yes? Continue. It's impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit I've tested the good word of, the, of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away to renew them to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the heart which drinks of the rain which often comes upon it and bear absolute for those from whom it's cultivated receives blessing from God. But if he bears stones and brass, is rejected near to being caused whose end is to be born. Continue. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your labor of law, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to sins and do minister. And we desire each one of you show the same diligence of full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Verse 13. When God made the promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself. Number one, I want you to know that God's promises are not subject to change. God said, I'm not a man. Are you following me? That I should what? That I should repent. God swore by himself. Why? Verse 14, saying, blessing, I will bless you, multiply, and I will multiply you. So after he had patiently endured, he, he obtained the promise. Continue. For men in this swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. So we elect somebody to be our governor, but we still say, hey, hey this man will steal our money. So what we raise to assuage our fears is called the swearing in. Even though it has become a useless ceremony. So we expect him. We look at him as a responsible man. I say, are you a Muslim, Christian, or a traditional worshiper? Then he said, I'm a Christian. 
bring the Bible, put his hand on the Bible. Then he said, I solemnly swear. After that, we can release all the Nigerian, our tribes disappear. When he commands us as commander-in-chief, we don't see him commanding from a parochial interest. We don't see him commanding from a narrow mind. Because we believe he has sworn by what? By someone greater than Allah oh Jemi. Ah, so bad they bear Allah. If you cannot fear God, then. But you know, we are living in the age where no one fear God. So he said, help me, God. But there are people, even the people that are swearing in me, they just want him to say the thing. Don't think, don't think. <laughs> but when God saw God, God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability. Do you know the meaning of immutability? You can't mute it. You know, you have your remote, you say, mute. What happens? You keep seeing the picture, you can't hear the word. God's promises are immutable. God's promises speaks permanently. Do you know why? If just only on the principle of promise, they are immutable. But much more than the principle of promise is the principle of the oath. So when he said two immutable things, he was speaking about the promise of God and the fact that God saw. In other words, that's the promise God gave to Abraham. That's the promise by which Jesus came. That's the promise to your life. The promise of God in your life is immutable. And let me tell you something. It cannot be downgraded. It cannot even be upgraded. Are you following me? He showed the heirs of the promise, the immutability of, of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, was that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Mm. God is not a man that is true. Uh -huh. How many of us take God's word that it is immutable? It can't get to your situation and change character. He sent his word. And his word healed them and delivered them. Can't get to your situation and say, it is, I cannot apply. Because it is immutable. Are you following me? Anytime it's not working, somewhere in the book of Isaiah, the, book, the, the prophets looked at God and looked at himself. And they discovered 90% of the problems is never with God. God's ears are not heavy. God's hands are not shortened. It is iniquity, which means the for what is coming out from God is an everlasting flow. It is the capacity of man to receive that is a variable. How many of you believe that what is coming out of God is an everlasting flow? Now, God is good is a permanent statement. God is good and he can do no evil. God is light. In him, is, there is no darkness at all. Someone said there is no darkness. And it's immutable. You cannot there's nothing you can do to mutate that reward that God is light. Uh, are you following me? So someone say, I have a perfect promise. Now when you say, let's go to perfection, I want to show you. Now the word you call New Testament, in actual sense, is not just New Testament. Can I tell you what it is? It's perfect testament. Because if it is New Testament, According to the principle of that which is new can become old, it can become old. So what God brought is not just a new testament. So every time you are looking at perfection, when you read Hebrews chapter 6, let's go to perfection. What is telling you principally there is to reveal to you the things that God has done that are never subject to change. And one of the things that is never subject to change again is the testament or the covenant between God and man in Christ. It is eternal. It will speak in time and eternity. Are you following me? Let me just rush. Now we have a perfect high priest. So when we say let's go to perfection, let me tell you, the, the, these are the elements of perfection. Number one, a perfect promise. Why is it perfect? Because it's a promise with a host by God. Number two, Perfect high priest. Hebrews 7 from verse 11. I don't think we have time to read all these things, but I'll just keep mentioning. Hebrews 7 from verse 11. 
If perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, someone say perfection. For under the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, not according to the order of Aaron. Levitical priesthood is raised after the order of Aaron, but in the scripture it is evident that there is another priest in the book of Psalm 10, he said, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You cannot say thou art a priest forever to Aaron. Because Aaron's priesthood is not forever. Aaron's priesthood is subject to change. Look at it. For the priesthood being changed, a necessity there is also a change of the law. For he whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. Jesus is a priest, but it's not from the tribe of Levi. Jesus, from whom no man has officiated at the altar. Which, which tribe did Jesus come from? Which tribe? Judah. For it is evident our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Automatically means his priesthood is not out of the Levitical priesthood. Are you following me? And it is far more evident that if in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. Let's do a Bible study. It is far more evident that after Melchizedek, there arises another priest. Where is the evidence? Bible study. Where is the evidence that Melchizedek? How many of you remember Melchizedek? Having no father, no mother, no descendant. So where, where is the evidence that there will be another priest? It's simple. I've said it on this altar. Psalm 110. Melchizedek's story is in Genesis 14. Psalm 110. Thou art the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So it, it is a thou art the priest Melchizedek. He said after the order, which means that God raised that priesthood and God said, I'm bringing something in this manner. And that priesthood is not from Aaron. So when you are reading the scripture, this, the scripture is like a law test people. You don't get it. The scripture will give you reference for the positions he arrives at. The scripture is not just, oh, God is a healer. It will show you why God is a healer. By his stripes. And it will show you how legally he had paid the price for your disobedience so that the blessing... So the next time you are claiming the blessing, you are claiming it from a legal standpoint. You are not wishing it. Did you get what I just said? You are not wishing it. You are what? Demanding it from a legal standpoint. A valid point. Are you following me? So it is more evident that of the order of Mexican, there arise another priest. What makes this priesthood perfect? Give me the next verse. Who has not come according to the law of a fleshly commandment but according to the power of endless life? For it testifies you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For in one hand there was an annulling of the former commandment because of his weaknesses and his unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better up through which we draw near to God. I'm just running. Inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath. For they, they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath, when the Lord said, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. Did you see again? The priesthood of Aaron has no swearing. God knows this man can be trusted. But when he was bringing it in the book of Psalms, this is the way he spoke. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever. The implication of this is that you can never come to a point in your life where you never have a representation before God again. Can never happen. It's permanent. It cannot be updated. It is true now. It will be true if this word waits for another 3,000 years. There is a priest in the presence of God. And you know what? It does not die. The, for, that's where one of his perfections. Because Aaron, there were so many priests because Aaron died. They didn't get to the promised land before Aaron died. The priesthood even changed in the wilderness for Eleazar, the son of Aaron, to become priest. But this priest is forever. And the funny thing is that 
Sometimes you are going to have some crook priests. By the time Jesus came, the type of priests that were on earth, Caiaphas and Annas, those ones could trade. Is it? It's better for one man to die. Than for the, can you imagine? Something that started so pristine in Aaron, by the time he got to Jesus' days, he had become so corrupted. But thank God we have a priest that does not die. Which means what he is yesterday is who he is today. Uh, you are not getting that picture. Are you getting that picture? The Lord has sworn we don't relent. You are a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek, for they have become, but, yeah, okay. By so much, Jesus has become a shorty of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he, he continues forever, as what? An unchangeable priesthood. He is able to save to the uttermost. No matter how far the enemy wants to take you, you will meet Jesus there. Because he has an unchangeable priesthood. And that priesthood is not just a new priesthood, it's the perfect high priest. Uh, they say, if you go to Hebrews 8, 1 to 6, there's a perfect tabernacle. The Bible says it's not like the tabernacle that was made with hands. Jesus did not enter an earthly tabernacle. He entered into heaven itself. He didn't perform shadows. He brought substance. Are you following me? Somebody say perfect tabernacle. Hebrews 8, 1 to 6. Hebrews 9, 6 to 18. Then there is a perfect covenant. Hebrews 8, 7 to 13. Perfect covenant. Are you still with me? Hebrews 8, 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for what? A second. But finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are come, said the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, and look at what he said. Next verse. Not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers, which means at the time, this was Jeremiah 31, 31. At the time Jeremiah was prophesying this word, there was a covenant. It was a covenant that was sealed in the blood of bulls and goats. But God now began to say, I'm going to do a new covenant. And it's not going to be like that old covenant. Are you following me? Because he saw the faults and the weaknesses. The reason why you have updates is because you have seen what? How many of you have updated and they will tell you it is to fix some bugs? There's no bug to fix in this covenant. This covenant is not just the new covenant. In another word, it's the perfect covenant. In another word, is the eternal covenant. Are you following me? So when you say, let's go to perfection, what I'm telling is, let's go to the perfect high priest. What I'm telling is, let's go to the perfect tabernacle. What I'm telling is, let's go to what? The perfect covenant. It's another word, is, is the perfect sacrifice. When it came, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 to 14, he said, uh, what did he call it? He said, um, Flesh and blood, he did not desire. How did he put it? Hebrews chapter 10. The sacrifices that they sacrifice yearly never brings them to what? Perfection. So when he came, he said, offerings and sacrifices I do not desire. Are you always saying that all these things is always setting something aside? The first one set aside a, a covenant. He said, I will make a covenant which is not according to one I have made. By that, it's automatically deleting something. Are you following? Then he said, a priest, after the order of Melchizedek, by that, it's automatically deleting another order. Are you following me? Then in this place, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. You have opened my ear. Burnt offering and sin you did not require. A body you have prepared for me. I come in the volume of book to do your will. What did he do? 
He had set aside. That's why today we are not going to bring gram and bring something for sacrifice. He had by one sacrifice perfected for all. All those who believe. How can one sacrifice perfect all those who believe? Because it's not just sacrifice. It's the perfect. So when I said let's come into perfection, what I'm calling you to is the perfect promise, the perfect high priest, the perfect tabernacle, the perfect covenant, the perfect sacrifice. And I will show you one. It's the perfect faith. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it began to show us faith. And by the time it got to verse 39, he said, all these died in faith, but they did not receive the promise. Which means, as powerful as faith was in that expression, he had a limitation. Then in chapter 12, he said, there, he now told us, he said, therefore, let's look unto Jesus, the author, and what? Finisher. You didn't get what I'm saying? This is not a faith that I would say, okay, but he could not accomplish this. This is a faith that is perfected. This is a faith that has finished it. Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the Christ, the cross, despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He said, consider when endure such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Verse 4, you have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Because what he's trying to talk to us there, if you go to to chapter from verse 1 to 11, he got to a point. He said, You see, even if your father is chastising you, he said, Don't worry, it is because he wants to receive you. It is not to, to, to reject you. There is something about this covenant and about this promise. It is always to accept you. Even when he's going through the process of discipline, it is never to reject you. It is always to confirm you. Are you following me? Which means the message there is that you can take in a stride every disciplines of God today in your life because they are there for your good. God is doing nothing anymore for your, against you. Even if he has to stand against certain issues in your life, it's because he has or is to receive you as his own. Are you following me, church? Praise God. So we have a perfect place. Finally, we have a perfect place. Zion or a perfect habitation. That's what you read in chapter 12. It now says, We have not come to a mountain that can be burnt with fire. But we have come. What is he doing? Setting aside some. But we have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. It's an innumerable company of angels. He said, Do not reject him who spoke on earth and the mountain shake. But look at the one who is speaking from heaven. He said, and he has said again, I will shake all things. And do you know what he now said? So that those things that can be shaken will be shaken. And those things that cannot be shaken will remain. Do you know what he said to us? We receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. There is no shaking again that can happen on the earth that can shift this kingdom. This kingdom is not like a mountain burning with fire. It's not combustible. You, you, yeah, do you get what they're trying to say? What he was trying to teach us basically is to come into that understanding that you have come into something God will never alter again. That was the type of promise he gave to David in the book of Psalm 90. I have spoken to David. I will no longer, I will not lie to him. Neither will I alter anything that has gone out of my mouth. That's the Davidic covenant. It's the type and shadow of the new covenant. The new covenant cannot be altered. You don't need another blood anywhere. If they call you anywhere, come and do one sacrifice, they are wasting your money. There is no other sacrifice anywhere. You can't alter it. You can't degrade it. You cannot even advance it. It's not just new. It's perfect. If you don't have any man to stand for you, you have a perfect eye priest. And the perfect eye priest said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And some of you need to update your memory. Because I showed you on Sunday that many at times we are the ones that need the update. Sometimes you say, baby has fun. Let me tell you something that you need to be updated with. 
there is no moment in your life again where you can be alone. He said, I will never leave. Whether you feel it or you don't feel it, it's there. Because if it's not there, you are not safe. But if you are saved, it's there. Are you following me, church? You are not alone. Hey, nobody is looking for me. Nobody. You, it might just be moments God is even looking for to create communication between you and him. For you to begin to discern and, and hear the, in, the inaudible and see the invisible. But that you are alone is never true anymore. But you know, you know, the young prophet moved. Because the Bible said they found him seated under the oak tree. All the braggado has left. All the, even if you give me a meal, I'm not coming. There are moments in your life where you are low. But you are not different. I know you are low. But you are not different. I know you are low, but he has not changed. Are you following me? Are you following me? There are moments we come to preach, and it's so normal. Everything just so yeah. <laughs> but we go in faith because he said, I will be with you, and I will confirm the words of your mouth. And sometimes we don't feel like there's anything to confirm. Can I tell you one truth? The miracles I've seen most have happened the days I didn't expect miracles. Sometimes when people are even telling me that the prayer you pray, that God answered, I'm asking whether that's the prayer. Because you know there are some prayers you pray. You yourself, you feel like, ah, I've known you, but you are. Should I come here? I was, I was more, more in the spirit. Today that I care, yes, it is where. And you cannot tell the person that you should come tomorrow, so it's where. Some people called me this afternoon. I told them, call me, call me again tonight. Because the time they were calling me, I felt like, no, oh, no. Maybe that night, maybe my spirit will be clear. But that's just your mind. That's just your mind. Now, you might need to take more time for yourself. When you take more time for yourself, it's you that will open up. Do you know the place where there's always a closed door? It's not the person that wants to enter. He said, I stand at the door. And knock. The close is never with God. He's already at the door. Closing is always with man. If any man will hear my voice from within and open the door, I will not get there and turn back. What will happen? I will come in. I would make knocks and disappear. Faithful, you see, who call? When you open the door, it's not that man that came to knock in Song of Solomon. You read that one? He said, by the time I opened, I said, I said, how can I stand up? My feet, is, I've already washed my feet. He said, by the time I opened the door, my lover was gone. That's not Jesus. You meet him there. It was Paul that was writing to the Corinthians. He said, you are not closed in us. You are only shut in yourself. How many of you see how fast things change when you turn to God? Some of you think God will still take so many years to sort. Say, I cannot commit myself to you again. You just discover that he has been waiting. Because you can't change him. He's been waiting. I don't know whether you get this picture. But I know the enemy is playing on your mind. And you're like, yeah, anymore is so like I said, when Israel saw what happened to the young prophet, he stopped fearing the word. So even the person that brought the word, see, he didn't get to the old prophet said, Ah, don't look at that the young prophet died. Then when I die, bury me in the place where you are burying this man. He said, Because what he said, he said, I've I've been able to separate what he said from who he is. He can move from the man of God and became the man that was disobedient to the word. But the word was the same when he, when he said it and when he disobeyed it. The word is alpha. It's omega. One person said, I am the beginning. And when you go back, I am the end. He said, I am the first. 
And when you get to the last, I am. It's still the same thing. Nothing has changed. It doesn't matter what has happened in between. Nothing has changed. Whether the world believes it or not, nothing has changed. Whether they, whether they embrace it or turn away from it, nothing has changed. Do you understand this? Are you updated enough in your mind about what I just shared? Are you updated that there is no guilt against you again? That all your sins, you know, there was this perfect, there was this imperfect way of dealing with sin. What was the perfect way? It was never pushed. It was covered. And so by the next year, they need to sacrifice to cover. So many people thought God has forgotten, forgiven them of an issue. But something went wrong. So this is where God is waiting for me. So he really did not forget. So when he just said it is where he did, he really meant <laughs> your sins will I forget. Hebrews, the book of the perfect statement. We remember them no more. This is not just forgiveness. This is a blotting out. She has said every handwriting that was against you. He didn't just set them as a he blotted them out. Which means when you go back to that page, it's blank. It's blank. It's blank. If, any, if the enemy wants to use one thing you did before. To hold on to raise a cause against you, tell them the page is blank. It's not just, you know, sometimes if you erase it, you can reconstruct it. But it was not erased, it was pushed. Are you following me? These are statements, and let me, I'm giving you spiritual weapons. You must allow to set truly. Don't let the enemy bring you down. Yeah, are there moments where God. I woke up this morning and I felt God has so many issues to settle with me. It was not a very exciting moment. I told Ninkana, when you discovered that when Fatai came, for one hour I didn't come down to you, it was Ninkana. I had more serious issues. To, so when Ninkana called me, I said, I'm praying. When I tell you I'm praying, and somebody's looking for I didn't come to you. To even get up was hard. Because have you ever prayed? The more you pray, the more you feel pressure. Right? Oh, get it, because people so far, eh? But every discipline of God is never rejection. Rejection is blotted out. It's not going to occur. It is acceptance. It is the son whom he accepts, whom he receives. So even when God is sitting on an issue in your life, it's because he wants to receive, not because he wants to refuse. Are you following me? So I say, Every time I said, God, what are you saying? All the scripture I was saying was dangerous scripture. We say, open to Jeremiah. Very few times can you read to Jeremiah and find good news. Therefore, you are a green olive tree. And I pushed you. God, let's stop there. Let's stop there. Let's remain, let's remain green olive. Let's remain fresh. What's wrong? Is there anything wrong? Tell me, is there anything wrong? How many of you know one of the most beautiful things about Christians is that no matter what happens, you can talk to God? Ah, you think I, I said you can talk to God. That address is permanent. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. We might need mercy to receive help, but help is available. You have praise, yeah. Yahweh. Yahweh, this worship is for you. Yeah, we see the, the lifting of my holiness is unto you, it's unto you, my Lord. You are praying. You are praying. Yeah, you are Yeah, we're 
Psalm 20, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 20, verse 7 and 8. It says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But remember the, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are bowed down, they are falling, but we are risen as them. Let me tell you certain things that doesn't change God. If you go to the wall with chariots, God is the same. If you go to the wall with stone, God is the same. There are certain things that are settled. Victory belongs to God. Victory is not by the weapon you came with. God can walk with arrows, but he can walk with stone. Say, Father, take what is in my hand and use it for your glory. It's not about what you have or what you don't have. It's about the hand that is upon you. Take what is in my hand and bring me victory. Bring me victory. Bring me victory. When I have stones or I have chariots, when I have support, I have few people. Victory is from the Lord. I want you to confess that. Because some of us look at it that we are. We seem not to have what it takes to compete. We seem not to have what it takes. But whether you come to this war, this psalm is a part we will remember the name of the Lord. If you remember the name of the Lord, you are updated. You are on the, you are on the cutting edge. You are on the cutting edge. If you can remember, if God is still in your memory, if everything you are doing, you are doing it in the name of the Lord, you are on the cutting edge. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Look at 2 Chronicles 14. Let me tell you another thing that does not change God. You need to update it. That God, give me verse, verse 8. Update in your mind. God can walk with many and with few. Those things. Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah. Who carries spears and shield from Benjamin 280,000 who carried shield and two bows. All these were mighty men of Elon. His entire army is 580,000 people. Yes. Zerah the Ethiopian came out against him with an army of a million men. So they had at least two soldiers to one man and 300 chariots and they came to Maressa. Yes. And as I went out against him and said the troops in battle array in the valley of Zephat at Maressa verse 11 as I cried to the Lord, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord. Say, Father, it does not matter how things are, I will never lack your help. Raise your voice and pray in the name of Jesus. God can help, whether with many or with few. I want you to get it updated in your mind that you will never lack help. Whether you seem to have all the people you need, or you seem not to have all the supplies you need. God can work with many. God can work with few. Look at your situation today and say, I know I have help. Because I am your son, I have help. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Philippians 4, verse 10 to 13, Paul said, I have learned both to abase and to abound. He discovered that in all things, he said, I've learned to be content in everything. I've learned that I can live and survive when I'm exploding and when I seem I'm brought low. Because God can work with the two. God's statement of victory sometimes is a people that should receive, but they refuse. They are based. And God's statement of victory sometimes is that he supplies for you from places you don't expect. Are you following me? Say, Father, I know. Whether by basing or abounding, I have victory in the name of Jesus. Whether by refusing or receiving, in the name of Jesus, wherever I go, all my needs are met and they are supplied according to the riches of your glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, raise your voice and pray that prayer. Raise your voice and pray that prayer. 
Nothing can be separated, subtracted from your experience anymore, whether by abounding or by abasing. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul said, I am persuaded, whether by life or by death, that Christ will be magnified in my body. Ah, you didn't get that. He said, even this chain they are doing, it is not subject to debate anymore that Christ will be magnified. He said, whether by life or by death, how much more by bondage? Say, Father, be magnified. Lord, take my story and use it for your glory. Everywhere I go, I am persuaded I will not be ashamed. I am persuaded I will operate with all boldness. I am persuaded that you will be magnified by every experience I face. You will be magnified. You will be magnified. You will be magnified. You will be magnified. That cannot be shaken anymore. This is a kingdom that cannot be shaken anymore. This is a perfect experience that's not subject to any debate anymore. She will be magnified. Thank you, Lord. And there is nothing you can do. Oh Lord, my eyes are on you. Be magnified. Oh Lord, be magnified. Sing it one more time, just once. Be magnified. Be magnified. of every started with us he told us to what follow deny ourselves carrying our cross daily Hosea said then you will know when you follow on to know if it's now you are persuaded whether by life or death you Christ will be magnified whether by abasing or abounding your needs will be met are you following me that in every way so if you are in an experience you don't yet understand the answer is what? Following. The answer is what? Because we know where it will end. Where will it end? Victory. If you know it's going to end in victory for you, say, it's ending for my good. Say, everything that is working is working together for my good. If you believe that, give the Lord a big hand of praise. Hallelujah. I pray the Lord will fill your heart with revelation. That the light of God will flood your hearts. That you will come to understand. And that his abiding presence will be seen by you. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we have prayed.